Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Mac McAnally, a retrospective. It is with great pleasure that we welcome a guest we have sought for years. Our special guest is an accomplished singer, songwriter, record producer, guitarist, pianist, and recording artist. His name is Mac McAnally. He is an inductee of the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, the Mississippi Musicians Hall of Fame, and in 2008, the Country Music Association named him Musician of the Year. So, Mr. McAnally, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Happy to be here. What was life like for you growing up in Mississippi? Well, uh, it was it was big fun. <laughs> you know, I I didn't we we were actually kind of lower middle class to poor, but I didn't know that. I'm probably the most spoiled poor kid that that ever was. I I, uh, I had two younger sisters, and for some reason or other, my whole family decided I was a musician as soon as I was born. So, uh, so that, that was, they were always not necessarily getting ready for me to be a famous musician or, or an accomplished musician, but they just like, that's what, that's what he's going to do. He's going to be a musician. So, uh, uh, whether I was born to do that or not, they decided it. So that, that's all anybody ever thought about was that I was going to play music and my, my whole family was musical. So it, it, it was just a joy growing up. Great little town, Belmont, Mississippi is my hometown. And my mom was the piano player in church, and we were always going to all day singings and you know some various services, weddings she played at, funerals she played at, gospel singing she played at, and and then during the week, two three nights a week, our whole neighborhood would come over to our house and and bring whatever musical instruments they had, and we didn't have television. We were like the last family in my hometown to get television, so everybody would bring instruments over and we'd play play music for entertainment, you know, just to just to entertain ourselves. So I'm not doing anything different. 50 years later than I was doing when I hit the ground. A couple of times I've heard you in your concerts, you've talked about your mom as being one of the best piano players you've ever heard. Well, she, she certainly influenced me. Uh, she, she was one of those gospel players that could do, that could, you know, get, get the heartstrings going with the way she played. And she always had a little extra, some little extra flourish that she added to what, what the next person down the road did. And, uh, she never thought of herself as any particular great musician, but she always impressed me and she wanted me to be, she wanted me to be a piano player and kind of forced me into piano lessons. And I, I negotiated my way over to the guitar when I was maybe about 11 years old, I think, uh, because you can take that fishing <laughs> <laughs> and piano is kind of a tough fishing tackle box. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so my piano playing suffered ever since then, but I still, uh, am grateful to her for, for holding my nose to the, to the fire for long enough to get a little bit of something going on the piano. So what kind of music was around the house growing up? We didn't, we didn't really categorize. Uh, we, we didn't have, we were in a little valley, so we couldn't get popular radio very much. And the, the one little radio station that we got was multi-format because it was such a small place. It would be, uh, they played gospel music in the morning, and then every day from 11 to noon, they had a one-hour obituary show where they sort of played minor key organ music and talked about the last person to die, which, <laughs> you know, people didn't die very often. We only had about 900 people in my hometown, so quite often, you know, you'd be a month talking about one guy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of an hour a day. <laughs> so so the organ player had a lot of pressure on them in the, in the obituary show on our radio. And then the afternoon, it would be country and then from about five o'clock at night until nine o'clock at night, it would be pop. So I heard those, those different kinds of music on, on our little one radio station. And in our family, we just liked everything music, anything anybody wanted to play, we would play. We made no, no prejudice or, or particular preference. I guess gospel music would have been the biggest preference in the family, but we liked everything. So. Was there a musician or a band in particular that you had that maybe influenced you more than others? Well, um, early on, I didn't have access to a lot of, uh, a lot of the best music that was getting made. I kind of got backwards into pop. The Beatles had broken up really by the time I got into what they were doing. And I, I was, I was old enough. I should have been aware of it, but I was just kind of in the northeast corner of Mississippi, which, you know, took a little longer to get there. But, uh, the Beatles at this point, probably more because of my studio work. They invented so many of the things that you do in the studio that they're probably the biggest influence on me of, of anybody. But, but from songwriting standpoint, the, the great country songwriters, uh, Merle Haggard, Willie Nelson, uh, Jimmy Buffett, uh, John Prine, the, the, those guys were a big influence on me. And, uh, the Amy Lou Harris's music and 
rock and roll band, Little Feet, all of that grew. I was a Mississippi guy, so anything that grew is is good for Mississippi. I, hard to pinpoint one, you know, but uh, I've just tried to sponge up everything and appreciate everything that I run into that's good, and there's, there is a lot of good music out there. Even, you know, it's harder to find today because there's less uh, delivery methods uh, that are that are known to everybody than when i was a kid but but there's still there's still kids making really good new music now and I, i'm looking for it i want to get blown away just as much at 50 years old as i did when i was 15 so so how did you start doing the session work in muscle shoals how'd that happen you know i played in church and then when i was about 13 this guy came to our house and told my parents he wanted me to play with him in a honky tonk at the state line tennessee state line my hometown was a dry county so there was no legal alcohol or anything. If you're going to play in a band, you pretty much had to go to Tennessee or go at least an hour away to Tupelo where there was legal alcohol sales and a place to play. And I didn't think they would go for that because I was underage and, and it was a honky tonk, but somehow or other, he told my folks he was a good Christian man and he would look after me and he'd pay me $250 a week. And I was 13. And that was more than my dad was making teaching school at that time and more than my mom made working at the pants factory. So, that Saturday night, I was there on the piano trying to learn <laughs> learn Merle Haggard songs on the fly at the Circle E Club in Iron City, Tennessee. And and I played a couple of years in the state line honky tonks. And the Muscle Shoals session guys were coming up there. Uh, that's where they went to get a beer after, because Muscle Shoals was a dry county too. And and Muscle Shoals, Alabama, there were a lot of rec- recording studios there. And those session players would come up to those nightclubs. Some of those guys heard me play and started asking me to come do a little thing in the studio with him every once in a while. So starting at about 15, I played on, you know, in studios and honky tonks and churches <laughs> and, uh, and I've, you know, added bigger venues via, via Mr. Buffett and some of the listening rooms that I played along the way, but I'm still doing the same thing as then. This question comes from Michael Utley. He wants to know, how did you get into the production end of the music business? Michael Utley. That's a familiar name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been busy, but that name is yes, it's f- very familiar. Uh, well, it wasn't intentional, but but from a, from the beginning, when I heard records, the way I heard them was I immediately said, "How did they do that? You know, how did they put who? How is that put together? What what part is?" And I would, you know, I had very primitive listening equipment. We we were school teachers' family, so we had a lot of these little. These little bitty turntables, you know, that, that were standard Mississippi public school issue turntable that you had to, you had to put about 35 cents change on the needle just to make it track. You know, it was not, it was not a, a good turntable, but it had a little left and right speaker. And I would, I would unplug one of the speakers and just listen to what was in the left side and then just listen to what was in the right side and see if I could figure out how it was put together. I've always been interested in, in how music was built up and arranging. And that would have been my initial interest. Uh, now, how I ended up producing records, I just had a couple of pals along the way that, that said, will you help me make this record? You know, they, they would be, they would either fire a producer or have some kind of falling out with their normal producer and say, I don't know who's going to produce my next record, but will you help me get started? You know, and I, and I, that's, I would help them get started and we'd have a good time. They go, well, you just do it. You know, and I, I was such a bashful kid. I would never have asked anybody to let me produce a record. Oh. Uh, so I have no idea how I ended up doing it, but I, I am very grateful to have done it because I enjoy it. And I've done almost all of the jobs involved in production over the years from playing, singing, arranging, backgrounds, right, engineer, uh, ha- having done all the little jobs that, that, that make up the record making process. I think I've got a good appreciation for how important all of those jobs are. And I try to treat all those people with respect and, uh, and I try to make it, recording an enjoyable thing it should be fun it's music it's one of the best things in the world you know so so many producers want to take something that's inherently fun and make it seem more like a job so they feel less guilty about getting to do it you know i'm the opposite i want it to be fun and and i'm out here out here on the road you know with with a guy who wants it to be fun too mr buffett is uh is one of the kings of fun and so (laughs) the the how i ended up producing his record is really that i don't think he traditionally you know, enjoy the studio nearly as much as he enjoyed his live world. And we just, uh, uh, along, along with Michael Utley, by the way, <laughs> uh, have, have tried to make it as much fun as possible. And we've been having fun this very week in the studio. So it's still working. 
Just this. What's that? Oh, yeah. I was hoping you could tell us about production on Nadira Shakur's latest album. Well, uh, you know, we, we've been hoping that Nadira would get to make a project for quite a while. She's such a fine singer and she's in the band and, you know, she deserves, she deserves some spotlight. And, uh, and we, you know, we give her tidbits of it with, uh, with the coral reefers every night, but she deserves one of her own. And, uh, we, we've, we've been lobbying and Jimmy sort of came up with the notion of, of cutting a record on her. And, uh, she asked, she asked me to help, I guess, just from having been around, you know, other, other projects that I was a producer on. And I'm, I'm very honored that she did. We had a great time putting some music together for her. Went over to Muscle Shoals and, uh, picked out some songs. She was kind enough to, to, to cut a couple of mine and, and sort of do a, a tribute album of Jimmy's songs, uh, that he's written over the years that are sort of her favorites that suited her voice. And we just had a great time. And I'm very, very, very tickled with how it turned out and, and to have gotten to do it. One of the songs that Nadira cut is one of my favorite songs of yours. Uh, and it was from your very first album. And the song is called People Call Me Jesus. I love that song. You know, it was, uh, <clears throat> that's the first song I ever wrote. That's, uh, that was the first. And I didn't know how songs were written. I, I'd never written a song, you know, and, and my hometown had a, had a curfew and they, uh, you were not supposed to be out after 10 o'clock at night. And I wandered around frequently, uh, after 10 o'clock at night, I'm not, not a huge rebel, but I was, I was that much of a rebel, you know, and, and that I would walk around after curfew and our church kept their doors open and we had a great grand piano in my, my church there. And so I, a lot of times when I was out late, I would just go sit and play the piano in the church and usually trying to play like my mom, you know, but this one night I sat down and, and played, just played this song. Like I'd always known it played, it wasn't really written. It just fell out, you know, in exactly the form that you would hear it on my album or on the Deer's album. And I said, well, gosh, that, that must be how people write songs that you just play them. Well, that's cool. You know, I, there, no work at all. You just sit down and a, and a song comes out. And, uh, and so I figured, well, I must be a songwriter. And hmm. I sat around for another year and a half or so and nothing else happened. So uh, then I said, well, maybe, maybe, maybe you have to try to write songs sometimes too. <laughs> and it turns out you do, but occasionally they just fall out. And that, that one was one that just happened. Since that was on your first album, can you remember the experience of making a record for the first time of your own? Well, I've done everything backwards uh, the whole time. I, I, I was playing some in the studio, and we were we were in Muscle Shoals one night, and we had some session booked, and the artist didn't show up. And uh, so there was this rhythm section sitting there ready to cut tracks, and we didn't have anything to cut. And the guy said, well, somebody, well, we've got this band here. Let's cut something. Somebody's got a song. And, they asked around and got to me and said, nope. And, you know, went around about three times. Everybody said, nope, I don't have anything. I said, nope, for the third time. And one of the engineers said, you know what? He's got songs. I know he's got songs. I played in bands with him. I know he writes songs. And they stayed on me until I played a song. And they went, oh, we'll cut a record on you. That's what we're going to do. We'll, we'll cut a record on you. And so I never went anywhere and asked anybody to listen to my songs. I never even played them for my parents. So they, wow. had to, they had to eavesdrop through the wall to hear what I was doing. I was just a shy kid and and these guys just said oh yep we're going to cut a record on you and we'll get a record deal you know you'll you'll be a recording artist <laughs> and, oh, interesting okay well <laughs> and so that's uh you know this this world that we live in now we're like american idol where you have to walk in and sing acapella in front of people to even have a chance to have a recording deal i i, I could never have done that would never have worked for me i would have gone and gotten a short order cook job somewhere <laughs> Another question from Mr. Utley. Mm -hmm. He asked, tell us all about Wayne Newton and what he asked you to do. <laughs> that, that, I, I know that's the real Mike Utley. <laughs> that's not an imposter. <laughs> well, w one of the records that we cut in Muscle Shells, we cut an album on Wayne Newton. And, uh, and Wayne was the biggest act in music at that time. He was playing the, the Desert Inn in Las Vegas and making – you know, he made like a half a million dollars a week in 1977. It was nobody was making that much money. And, and he worked all the time and he had this huge band and we, we cut him and he, it was around the time I was making my first album and he sort of, uh, became enamored with me as a songwriter. He got, he, he really liked some of the songs on the first album and he's like, okay, whenever you come west, you're coming to see me. 
And whenever you play out there, I'm going to come and see you. And so it turns out that I got booked uh, in Lake Tahoe. I was opening for Kenny Rankin, who passed away this last week. Uh, and I had a little 20 minute opening spot and Wayne flew down to Tahoe in his plane and, and watched my little 20 minutes. And my, I had never really played very much and that record came out. So I, my, my method was just to sort of talk about the songs and self deprecate a little bit. And, and so it, it, 20 minutes ended up being, you know, maybe three or four songs and, and mostly storytelling, uh, cause I was, more nervous about singing than I was talking. And that, that's, that's kind of how I presented myself. And it's still pretty similar today. And Wayne came backstage after and he said, you're, you're a comedian. I was like, I was, you know, I was 19. I was like, no, I'm not. I was wearing my grandfather's overall. So I was probably funny looking enough to be a comedian. But, uh, he said, no, you're, you're a comedian. You're, you're funnier than the comedian that I have opening for me now and in Vegas. I go, I'm not a comedian, but anyway, Wayne, that night offered me a job opening for him at the desert Inn and in Las Vegas for more money than I have ever made in my life to this day. And I'm, I was 19 and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm 51 now. And, uh, and he, he offered me more money than I've ever made in my life. And I just said, no, no, I'm not a comedian. I didn't, it, <laughs> it was a, it was a semantic thing. I didn't get it. What he was saying, he's like, no, you know, I'm not asking you to do anything different than what you do. It's just what you just did. If you would do that, I would, I would give you this and you could, I was like, no, I'm not a comedian. You know, I, I wasn't trying to be, uh, you know, disagreeable. I just, I just didn't get what he was saying because I hadn't played shows very much. And, and I, you know, and I'm still that good of a businessman today. <laughs> just as good as I was when I was 19. To, did not take the gig. No, I, I absolutely said no. No, I, I, I said, no, I'm not a comedian. I can't do that. Yes, you <laughs> you, I, yeah, well, you can't look back, but but in, in reality, though, at that time, I, I, I was not prepared for. Uh, I could I could never have lived in Las Vegas at that point. You know, I, the it, it was just overwhelming to even go there and see it. I, when I saw it for the first time, it was just drop jaw. When you look at all the songs that you've written, do you have a favorite? You know, many of them really seem like gifts. You know, the ones that happened. Instantly, the first single that was out was, was it called It's a Crazy World? And it was one of those just written in three and a half minutes, the amount of time it takes to play all these years, uh, for Sawyer Brown was one of those. And that's one of my favorite songs. I, I, the, my first number one was Old Flame, which is sort of, I was me trying to play gospel like my mom and write sort of a gospel chorus in a country music format. And that was gratifying. But, but most of the things that I've written that were hits, I end up feeling like, one of the regular songwriters would have written eventually. Somebody would have written Old Flame eventually. So the ones that end up being my personal favorites, I think, are the ones that I think wouldn't be here if it weren't for me. Uh, something like uh, Socrates. My uh, favorite. One of them. Yeah. Well, thank you. I uh, love that song. Especially uh, the one line, uh, <clears throat> Do you know what you are capable of knowing? Do your hand, son, ever touch the soil? I love that. Well, thank you. No, it, it, it stood the hair up on my arm to to write that and and I you know not it's not that I think it's a great song I think it's it's a cool vantage point and it's a song that wouldn't be here if it weren't for me so the, you know the fact that somehow or other I'm I'm some kind of filter of of life came down through that and that thing ends up existing because of me that I feel more special because that song is here the songs that I've written that are a little bit more generalized like two dozen roses or old flame I'm very proud and honored that that they succeeded and that we did well but probably not as personally attached because somebody else would have probably written them eventually anyway. So Socrates, Southbound, uh, Somewhere Nice Forever is, you know, just my, me and my grandmother. That's a conversation I never got to have with my grandmother as she was passing away. And so that, you know, that one wouldn't be here if it weren't for me. So. Socrates always makes me think you can't take any person for granted. You know, it's easy sometimes to do some to to to, to recognize someone that can help you, but yes. someone that you think can't. You know, it, it, yeah, no, it's it's not right to write anybody off. You never know. We we don't really know what we're capable of, uh, good and bad. You know, and and it's 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 wrong to assume any any of that any time. I think you've opened for some really interesting people, like uh, Randy Newman. Mm -hmm. Is that true? One of my heroes. Yeah. 
What was that like? We did a whole uh, long run together during when he had short people out, and it was just the two of us, two, two one-man shows. And because I played a little piano, I could do the sound check for both of us. It was very easy on Randy, you know. And uh, and he's one of the best writers in the world, so it was great to, to, to even get considered in the context of him. And, and still, he's still one of my heroes. And uh, I, I still hear occasionally him say something nice about me, so it's uh, I'm, I'm honored by that as well. So how did you meet Mr. Jimmy Buffett? You've had a relationship with him for a long time, and it seems like it's a special uh, relationship. When you guys get on stage, and I, I heard that there's going to be a, an album of his encore sets, and sometimes you come out and play with him. Yes, this is all true. And uh, we, uh, when that first album came out that that that, that I made unintentionally <laughs> back in 1976, uh, the people who signed a record deal for that were actually – the people who had been at ABC Dunhill and who had given Jimmy his first album deal. And, uh, they, uh, they sent him a copy of my record said, Hey, we just cut this, this other kid from Mississippi. That's a storyteller. And what, tell us what you think. And he, he sent me a little note back and said, you know, we're, we're both storytellers. We're both songwriters from Mississippi. We're going to be friends. We're going to write songs together. I'm going to cut some of your songs. We're going to have fun. And, you know, I didn't know anything about the music business at all, but I knew that somebody from my home state had succeeded and somebody from my home state that had succeeded had said something good about me. And that was very much a confidence builder for me back then. And, you know, you learn later that, that most people in the music business don't necessarily mean what they say. But I learned even later than that that Jimmy Buffett does. And all of those things that he told me in that letter came true, plus exponentially more. Wow. One of the songs that he cut that you have also recorded that you wrote is on uh, Nothing But The Truth, uh, and that's The City. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember this, but when you were doing the tour for Semi-True Stories, I had written a story about you called Semi-True Storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I, I went out, to, I think this was at the Variety Playhouse, and I had a cassette recorder with me. That was where we did that interview. But I was telling you that there was a guy that he passed away. His name was Barry Ham, and he loved that song so much. So tell us about that song. It's a great song, both versions. Well, you know, it 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 came from the sort of general nature. In in small towns, we were sort of taught to fear cities, and so I grew up scared to death, and and I had this built up fear, and and that fear was being shot down when I got into the music business. I was going around to all these cities where I would all, you know, I'd been told that people would kill me for no other reason than that I'm a small town guy, and 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 they weren't killing me. So I, I was I was learning one city at a time that that I had been mistaken, you know, that people aren't as different as as we would have each other believe, you know. So you know, people in the country say. You got to be afraid of people from the city and people from the city, as it turns out, say the same thing about people from the country. They're scared to death of us. And, and I just r realized along the way that, that we have a lot in common. And I was sitting in Tampa, Florida, a little club called the Peanut Gallery, getting ready to play a little, uh, a little folk music set. And we did a sound check and, uh, Finished, and the people who were my, my wife then uh, was was traveling with me, and I had a road manager with me, and they went out on some venture to try to buy something, and I was just by myself at this little club. I sat on the the stage of the Peanut Gallery and wrote that song uh, between sound check and showtime, and you know it's I don't know that how profound it is, but people come up all the time and say, you know, you you sort of nailed that for whether whichever vantage point they see it from, whether they're city people who are afraid of small town guys or or the vice versa, like myself, it does seem to connect. When somebody is listening to one of your records, or when they are seeing you play by yourself or with somebody else, like like Jimmy Buffett, what is it that you hope that the listener gets out of the experience? Well. You know, it's not an original line, but I think the I think Martin Luther, uh, the 1500s Martin Luther, I, I think he said there is nothing more religious than than for a man who was put here to farm, to farm. Hmm. That's the most religious thing you could do. And and my family said when I hit the ground that I was put here to make music. So so I hope they see a religious experience when they when they see me play music because that's the way I think of it. I think I'm doing what I was put here to do. And there's nothing more in the world that would feel more right 
than than when I'm playing music. And it doesn't matter if I'm just offending my neighbors at five in the morning with my bad version of gospel piano, or if I'm at Bonnaroo uh, with Jimmy, or if I'm if I'm in the tiniest listening room with Mac. Or it, do, it really doesn't matter in what form I'm making music or whether I'm getting paid for it, or it's it's just the physical act of me doing what I feel like I'm put here to do. And it really, I don't even think it has anything to do with being good at it. It just, it feels like that's what I'm here for. And so it feels good. There have been a couple of songs of yours that Kenny Chesney has covered, like mm-hmm. uh, Down the Road and Back Where I Come From. What is he like? And, and tell us a little bit about those songs. Well, uh, Kenny's a great guy. And, and he's, he's like Jimmy, has always been an advocate of, of what I do. And, uh, I, uh, am just that, that, that particularly the album that those two songs came from, Simple Life, Kenny has always been a fan. And, and that's probably where my natural songwriting ear was probably most commercial as it relates to the country music field. That, that album, I think it had 11 songs on it. And I, I think I've had 28 cuts from that album. Wow. Uh, so, so several of the songs have been cut more than one time. Uh, every song on that album, except just that way has been covered of the 11. So, so it was a sort of a commercial time for me. I wasn't intentional. It's just what I was hearing in my head, but, but down the road and back where I come from were very close to me personally, but somehow or other they were, they, they had a commercial aspect as well. So there's an artist uh, who's no longer with us, but I've always been a big fan of Chris Ledoux. Oh yeah, and you produced. Didn't you produce a couple of his albums? Yes, but one of the highlights of my life was just knowing Chris Ledoux. I, you know, before you add on the producing the records, he's probably the least music business kind of music artist that I've ever known. He was the most regular guy I've ever known. Uh, you know, I, I I I try. I feel like a very genuine person, and I go out of my way to try to maintain being a genuine person. And and Chris was so much that way that that I felt full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> when I was around him, I was like, I would walk away from Chris going, you know, I'm, I'm kind of full of it. <laughs> you know, he's just, he's just that real because I, I mean, I've had people tell me that I made them feel that way. So I, I, I he was that, he, he was just the most genuine guy. Just his heart was right there all the time. There's a song you wrote with uh, Jimmy Buffett called Changing Channels. Right. And it got me thinking, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have kicked this around. Have you all ever talked about, about doing a show as a duo, like a tour? We actually did a little mini tour that we call the Living Room Tour uh, in 1989. And just we, we put living room furniture on the stage, and uh, and we had microphones at every chair, and we had a big screen television that only would change channels between the Three Stooges and, and Andy Griffith. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, it was quite fun. We've actually talked about redoing that. And, and during the course of every year, we probably play five or six shows that are just the two of us, and uh, it will happen at some time. We have a great time playing together, and it, it makes it a nice. Uh, it, we're compact in that we can, you know, like last year where they dropped us onto an aircraft carrier, just the two of us, and we went and played for the, the Harry S. Truman. You know, to be compact and and to be able to go and anywhere and do that we we went to the long bar where the singapore sling was invented in <laughs> in singapore and and dropped in there and played us that you know it's just a blast to be able to do that well tell us about that song changing channels it was a short story from tales of margaritaville and uh we got together down in thomasville georgia jimmy had this way cool place he stayed down there it had this porch that wrapped around it and we, we, we each had our own porch swing and we were sitting there in porch swings and guitars and started talking about that story and, and, and how to turn it. He was, he was trying to write a few songs relative to the book. And, uh, and that just happened very easily. That's, uh, I think that was maybe the second song that we wrote together. Coast is clear being the, being the first one and still a pet song to this day. I still pull that one out and play it quite frequently. I like the little couple of cool little melody turns in it. This can be hard sometimes for musicians to answer, but if you could put it into words, what is it that you like about music? Well, you know, there, there's very little that I don't like. What, what the, the, the thing that I like about music is what it transcends. You know, we're, we do tend to emphasize our differences. You know, people that look one way 
are suspicious of people that look another way, and people that speak one language are suspicious of people that speak another language, and music transcends all of that. You know, you you can you can go anywhere in the world and sing "You Are My Sunshine," and it lights somebody's heart up, and they don't even know what it's saying. <laughs> they just they'll raise up and sing it. You know, what else does that besides music? It's you know, it's it's the best thing there is to me, and and you know, I I'm just happy that somehow or other. My grandmother, whether mistakenly or correctly, decided that I was here. One one of my grandmothers, when I was born, said he's got the call to preach, which in Mississippi is about as noble as they can put it. And the other grandmother said he's got the call to preach music. Hmm. And I don't know which one said which, but I'm awfully grateful that they added the word. <laughs> <laughs> We're. Uh, I know you got to get up on stage in a in a, in a few minutes, yeah. but uh, tell us about the new album. Uh. Well, you know, I make a record about every three years, whether I have to or not. <laughs> it's usually me having a either mistakenly or correctly think I, I've, I've figured something out about life and I want to document it in a song or a group of songs. And it was about time for me to make a record, although I had enough production stuff going this year that I didn't really have time to. And uh, Chesney put out a single of Down the Road with me as a duet partner, which I advised him against. And uh, he kind of made it work anyway. <laughs> And so the the record did well, and and it just sort of coincided with with me writing a couple of songs that the uh, folks got all excited about and said, you know, you need to sing this. This is specifically the song "You First, which is the just got released as a single. They said, this is yours to sing. You don't need to pitch this song. You need to sing it. And so uh, I ended up in the studio making an album in a hurry. I mean, I had songs. It wasn't like I had to. I didn't have to crash right. I, I had songs ready, but. Uh, but I had to make this record kind of on a time frame. The, the idea of anything being urgent to a 50 year old songwriter is un, it's not, not common, but, <laughs> but you know, there, there apparently is somebody that wants me to hurry up and make a record. So I'm trying to do it. I have two final questions before we go. Yes. What is your all time favorite meal? All time favorite meal would, there's been a bunch of great ones. I'm, I, I'm, I, 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 but my all time favorite meal and I'd pay, more money than I have in my bank account to have it right now is, is I just would call my grandmother any time of any day and call out the menu and it would be ready in about 45 minutes. Exactly what I asked for. And, and I wouldn't even have to eat if I could do that right now. It'd, it'd be the best thing in the world. So that would be it. Um, my last question before we go for Mr. Mac McAnally, this broadcast is going out all over the world. Yeah. So what would you, Mac McAnally, like to say to all the people that are listening in? In, enjoy every breath. Enjoy every, every breath of this life. Life's the best thing in the world. It doesn't matter what life you have. It doesn't matter. I mean, there's people that, that have six weeks left to live that have cancer, and life is the best thing that they have. Enjoy it. It's it's mighty fine thing. It's a blessing. Very good. Mr. McAnally, thank you very much for doing this interview. It's a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, one quick question. Yeah? Have you ever thrown a pizza into an audience? Oh, Absolutely. More than one occasion, more than one city. I've, 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 I've been associated with the hitting of a famous person with a pizza that was wearing a fur coat that ended up having to get paid for by someone that I work for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. so I have, yes. Yeah.